So hello everyone and welcome to the Jaeger project session. Um, I'm again excited to be here after the KubeCon uh, in Paris. Uh, my name is Pavel, I'm a Jaeger maintainer. Um, and um, yeah, apart from Jaeger, I work as well on open telemetry. I'm the operator maintainer uh, and I have been working in observability space for a long time. And in my free time, when I'm not working, I'm based in Switzerland, so I do a lot of mountain sports, like skiing, mountain biking. Hey everyone, my name's Jonah Cowell. Uh, I, my day job is I run product uh, for a company called Pessler that's in the monitoring space. You might have heard of PRTG. It's been around for a long time. Uh, in my open source work, besides working on Jaeger, I also uh, work on open search. I'm part of the steering committee and was part of bringing that into the Linux Foundation. And for fun, opposite of Pavel, I spend my time underwater, and that's what I like doing in all the spare time I get at home, uh, living down in Florida. So with that, I will kick this off. We're going to talk a little bit about for those of you, can I get a show of hands? Who doesn't know what distributed tracing is? There's a couple, so we're gonna give you the basics, explain why it's important, how it solves problems. We're gonna uh, dive into Jaeger. We're gonna do a couple of demos. One is just on Jaeger itself, and then we're gonna do a demo on monitoring, uh, incorporating Prometheus and Jaeger together. And we'll talk about the exciting new release, Jaeger version two. We posted a blog uh, on Monday uh, on the CNCF website announcing Jaeger v2, so we're gonna dig into that. And uh, then we'll talk about the roadmap and maybe we'll have time for some questions, but we have a booth also in the mornings on the show floor, so feel free to pop by, talk to Pavel or myself, we'll be there in the mornings for the next couple days. Thanks. So let's understand a little bit about why distributed tracing is important and a little bit about what it is. So most organizations are building microservices architectures, and this really gets challenging because different teams really own those microservices from end to end. And so the problem is when something breaks or is slow, you have to figure out which team is responsible for getting the site back online, speeding it up, so there's often a lot of finger pointing, and with distributed tracing, there's no longer finger pointing because you have solid data to help the teams identify and solve the problems. So the first benefit is root cause analysis. Show me the problem, where it occurred within this complex web of microservices that the team has been building, and uh, visualize that map, understand the dependencies, drill into specific transactions and user actions, and this really lets everyone collaborate in the same language, really talking about the application and the user. And then finally, you can use this data to monitor. Tell me when things are going south, tell me when there are problems with my application so that the team can get on it and fix it. Uh, so those are the basics. The way that we talk about it is there's typically a few steps to using distributed tracing. The first is instrumentation. Uh, in this case, we're going to talk a lot about open telemetry. The second is how you collect that data and store it in a database, and then how do you visualize it and analyze the data. Those are kind of the steps involved here. You have a mic. It's good. Okay, thank you. So I will do introduction to Jaeger, and after that we will do a demo with Jaeger. And I think introduction is, is necessary because it explains kind of the concepts that we use in distributed tracing. From the data model perspective, there are really, really like two structures that we use. The first one is trace, which uh, models kind of end-to-end -end execution of a request as it goes through multiple services. And trace consists of spans, and span is, it represents some work that has been done in a system. Um, and most importantly is the span contains contextual information that we call tags or attributes. 
And these attributes, they really tell you, you know, what was the operation about. And by looking at these attributes, you understand what the system was essentially doing. And so what we see here are two kind of visualizations that we use in tracing to, uh, to visualize a trace. The trace usually starts with the root span. That was the first operation that was executed. Uh, and then there are child spans that are, you know, child operations uh, that started after. Um, most tracing tools use the visualization on the right. We call it a timeline view or a gun chart. And we will see that in the, in the Jaeger demo. So I'll switch to console. And what I'm going to run is the, the example application from Jaeger. We, it's called Hot Rod. And it's a web app, so I'm going to switch to browser and load it up. Make it a little bit bigger. And so what it does when I click on one of these buttons, I essentially order a car ride. Um, it's like Uber, so let's do that. When I click on it, um, I will get a car with this license plate that will arrive in two minutes. Um, and this was the request ID and the latency measured from the browser. Now, traditionally, we are, we are used to use logs to understand the application. And by looking at these logs, maybe it's too large, but when I make it smaller, and I look at the logs, I should be able to understand what the, what the app is doing, right? It, it's first getting the customer, it's loading the customer, it found the customer, then it's trying to find drivers, it found the driver, then it's calling some Redis, um, and finally it will dispatch the, um, the final kind of um, response to end user. So that's pretty okay, but if there are multiple kind of concurrent requests in a system, which is usually the case in production, then the logs become kind of unreadable because they are mixed together, right? And in this case, all these services run on a single host, but in distributed systems, this becomes even more complicated because we have services running on different machines and we need to get these logs uh, into a central place. So this is exactly what tracing solves. Um, so I'm going to switch to Jaeger, and Jaeger, it's able to, you know, it collects the trace information, but on top of that, it's able to as well um, kind of construct the architecture diagram that helps us to understand, you know, what is the, the overall architecture of the system. So here I see that there is a front-end service, three and other services, and then two databases. And I'm as well able to see you know, how many calls are between those services. So I see the Redis is utilized a lot and the route service is utilized a lot as well. But I'm not able to kind of debug the, uh, the execution or, or the transaction, right? For that, I need to go to search and search for the traces that has been recorded. And in this case, I see the, you know, the, the results. I'm able to pick the, the one that took the, the longest time. In this case, it's this one. And here I get the timeline view that I showed you before. Um, there is a lot of information, but it's actually very easy to understand this screen. On the left side, we see the, the service name with operation. And on the right side, we see the, um, the execution of that operation. So the first operation is the root span, and it took 1.6 seconds almost. Um, and then there was a child operation from, again, front-end service. Uh, and then this MySQL operation that took 1.2 seconds, which is maybe like 80% of the entire transaction. So by looking at the screen, I'm immediately able to you know, understand the timings of operation and understand where the time is being spent. Um, we have as well this uh, black line, black solid line, that denotes the, the critical path. So if I want to optimize the execution time of this, uh, 
of this trace or transaction, I should be looking only at the spans that are on the critical path. So let's take a look at this MySQL request. Um, by looking at the tags or attributes from OpenTelemetry, um, they record the SQL query. Um, so I was querying for the customer. Um, but I'm not sure why it took like 1.2 seconds, right? For that, maybe I can look at the logs. And in the logs, I see that the, this operation was actually blocked uh, by these mm, transactions that were uh, you know, in the queue before. Right? So this is like a shared resource in a system, and there were a couple of transactions before that had to be executed. Um, the logs that we see here, um, they are, uh, they can be like, you can configure instrumentation that runs in the process to redirect standard logging into the span logs. Um, and then we'll get, you know, each log line associated exactly with each operation in a system. Okay, another pattern that is here is this call to Redis. Um, we see this staircase pattern, which means that the calls to Redis were done in, in, in a sequence or in a loop. Um, and it's something that probably could be optimized by using batch API or maybe uh, you know, executing multiple Go routines um, in parallel. What we have here as well are the exclamation marks, which denotes uh, a problem and error in a system. So there is an error tag and as well a log, which logs the exception message. So in this case, there was a timeout Redis. OK, and then we again see some staircase pattern. But in this case, there are one, two, three operations done in parallel. And then as soon as the first one finishes, the next one starts. So there is some parallelism, but it's only bounded to, to values three. So probably we should kind of uh, increase number of Go routines uh, to execute all these requests in parallel. What is super cool about tracing is that these, um, these tags or attributes, they are consistent across languages and frameworks, which is very important in distributed systems because we nowadays use, you know, um, different technology for, for different, uh, to, imp to implement different business cases, um, which is not the case with logging, right? With logging, there is no standardization. Um, different languages use different, um, different formats. They put different information into logs, which makes it complicated to understand the logging. Um, so if I look at the, the HTTP request in a front-end service, and then in driver, uh, or maybe root service, I will see exactly similar attributes, right? I see the HTTP method, the response code, uh, the URL, and so on. What I forgot to mention is the process. Um, the process holds information about, you know, from where this data is coming. So this is running on my local host, but if this was running on Kubernetes, we would get here the deployment name, pod name, namespace, um, and so on. Yeah. And so the last thing what I want to show you here is the, uh, the compare feature that we have. It's like a diff for traces where you can compare two traces. Um, so in this case, I'm comparing A to B. Uh, and the B has 40 spans, which shows me this uh, green box, which is uh, the difference. This is a great visualization to compare large traces. Um, it helps us to identify the operations that might have caused the issue. OK, I think this is all from the basic functionality. Thank you. Thanks for the demo. I'm going to switch back to the slides, and we'll continue on here. All right. So Pavel went over all of these features. That's kind of the backup. The one thing he didn't show that's kind of cool is besides that timeline view, this is a flame graph view. So you can actually switch in the UI between 
table view, which helps you roll up data. The flame graph view is a relatively new feature that's really helpful to give you a different visualization. So Jaeger is about flexibility of visualization for this uh, trace data. So I want to dig in a little bit about how tracing and metrics work together and some of the things we've done within Jaeger uh, over the last uh, year, year and a half. So uh, the goal here was to move Jaeger from being a debugging and diagnostic tool to being more of a monitoring tool. Those of you that have been around for a while might know the terminology APM. APM is about combining metrics and tracing together typically. So we wanted to bring Jaeger a little bit forward to make it more operationally focused. So this helps unlock some of the use cases in the bottom, monitoring, alerting, understanding when things are changing, um, and just having summary metrics around it. So what uh, we've done is uh, Jaeger now emits uh, native Prometheus metrics, so you can either remote write them directly from Jaeger or you can scrape them just like any Prometheus endpoint. And this is provided by OpenTelemetry and is part of Jaeger. Uh, the main goal is really to produce these metrics at the bottom, which give you an idea of the rate of requests, the errors, and the duration uh, on average in aggregate. So I'm going to show you a little bit about that in a demo in just a moment. Uh, this is a little bit of the data flow. So basically within Jaeger, we are emitting these directly into your Prometheus uh, backend, uh, and then you can query them through the UI. If you're using another metric tool like Grafana or Perseus, you can query those metrics, build cool dashboards, and do all kinds of things with them in other tools, not just within Jaeger. So the configuration for this, which this is a little precursor to Jaeger version 2, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, is quite simple. This looks exactly like an open telemetry configuration because Jaeger version 2 is built on open telemetry. So you can just define this directly in Jaeger, and then those metrics are available to be scraped or remote written if you decide to do it that way. Uh, so very straightforward. And then I'll show you this in the demo, but this is how they're visualized in the Jaeger UI uh, within the monitoring tab. So let's flip over to another demo. So we've been running another Docker instance on this host, um, which is running a different demo that's specifically designed to show us uh, the monitoring data. So in this monitor tab, uh, since we've started running this for a little while, we're now collecting data, latency, error rate, and request rate. We can pick the specific uh, component of the application. If we want to see everything from the front end view, it'll show it here. The methods or the operations will be listed below. And so these metrics just make it easier to get an overall idea of how your application is doing. If I were to look here and see the latency start to go up, that there's an issue happening, I can then drill into that and really debug the problem. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a helpful view uh, to have. And then you can switch from this view into the trace view specifically for that service and then debug you know, if there's a problem going on or something that's running slow. So it's yet another way to use Jaeger more operationally. Uh, so uh, definitely check that out and go back to the slideshow. So you wanted to start? Oh, I'm starting this, sorry. Uh, so the exciting thing that we just announced on Monday, the official release was on Sunday of Jaeger version 2. We release Jaeger every month. Now we're releasing version 1 and version 2. But the big news here is that open telemetry is now really core to the Jaeger components. So when we started this project about two years ago, uh, the goal was how do we make Jaeger more like open telemetry and share components so that we can work even closer together as two different projects. So the goal here was how do we adapt the storage APIs and everything that's part of Jaeger into basically a new type of open telemetry distribution with some additional capabilities. 
Uh, when we started, we couldn't do a lot of the things we needed, so the team had to make a lot of contributions to open telemetry to allow us to do what we've been able to do. So it's really furthered the project. We work together. Uh, most of the maintainers of Jaeger also maintain open telemetry. So we all work together to try to make everything nicer and easier for the users. Um, and the goal was really to make it native uh, within Jaeger to speak open telemetry and have those components. We also moved from multiple binaries in the distribution to a single binary with a YAML configuration. So when Jaeger was created, the microservices were built separately as Go, Go programs, and each had a lot of command line parameters that would allow you to configure it. So there was no config file. Fast forward to today, and everyone wants to use YAML, and that's how OTEL works, and now that's how Jaeger works. So it makes it kind of more consistent with the ecosystem. When you look inside Jaeger, these are the components that we actually bring together. So you basically have a pipeline that allows you to take that, that trace data coming in to do processing, to do filtering, to do any type of sampling, and then export the data to a supported backend for Jaeger. We still support the same backends, which are Cassandra, OpenSearch, and Elasticsearch. We are working on more. You'll see that in the roadmap part. And then the Jaeger UI queries that database. So this is all together as a single binary. Um, but you can also split this apart and run different components separately just by changing the config. So. Yeah, so this is the YAML config that Jonah mentioned. Um, it's essentially open telemetry collector config. Um, and in the Jaeger project, we, we have added a couple of components. The most important one is the, uh, the Jaeger query extension, which exposes the query API and the UI, uh, and Jaeger storage, which, where you define the, the store um, that you want to use. Um, and then the rest is essentially open telemetry collector. You can use all I think what we do, we kind of build Jaeger V2 with kind of predefined set of open telemetry collector components. Um, but I would say the majority of the most important ones are in this distribution. Um, and uh, what is cool about this config uh, is that the in, in the storage, you can define you know, multiple storage backends that you want to use, which is super flexible because then you can, for instance, store some type of data or some data from specific namespace or of a specific tenant to one storage and the other to into uh, a separate storage, which I think it's, it's very cool and very flexible. The, um, the deployment architecture, um, the application it's usually instrumented, or we recommend people to use the open telemetry SDK and auto instrumentation. Um, and then that talks to the Jaeger, which is again like a single component. Before we used to have the, the co collector agent and query in a separate components, but now it's all in, um, in a single process, which has a receiver, um, which is the OTLP receiver, and then the Jaeger storage, which stores the data into the backend. The, the Jaeger query, uh, it's on this picture on a separate kind of box, but it can be deployed in the same, usually it will be deployed in the same box as the collector. This is architecture with the queuing. Um, we use the, um, the Kafka receiver and exporter from the open telemetry collector contrib. Um, and again, like you can use them and define them in the um, again in the, in the YAML file that uh, that the Jaeger that we use to configure Jaeger. Um, so, how do you deploy Jaeger v2 on Kubernetes? We are planning to use the Open Telemetry operator because essentially Jaeger v2 is Open Telemetry collector, so it should be able to deploy it with the same uh, deployment technology as the Open Telemetry collector. And um, yeah, let's go to new features. New features. Thanks, Pavel. 
See, the reason why we're able to use the open telemetry operator and make this really simple and straightforward is because Pavel works on both. So we just shortcutted the whole process and made it nice for the users, uh, which is an advantage of us working together. So some new features, obviously Jaeger V2 is the big news, uh, you know, and having full native Kafka support and just having that pluggable architecture, I think future proofs the project and makes it so that we work together. We have official support now for Elasticsearch 8. It was sort of took us a while to get there, but now it's officially supported. Um, and then there's some new AP query API, which we call Jaeger V3. Sorry, it's confusing with all these versions of things, but um, we also have uh, started officially supporting uh, sampling and some other capabilities on additional backends. So this was mostly on Cassandra. We've extended it to the other components. So uh, Badger is something that you can use for non-production, non-high scale. Uh, performance and then you know off to Elasticsearch or OpenSearch. Uh, a bunch of new capabilities in the UI like being able to zoom, uh, different uh, kinds of selectors and things in the UI. The critical path visualization is also new since the last KubeCon which is a great feature, super helpful. Um, and uh, the roadmap for Jaeger v2, as Pavel mentioned, the Kubernetes operators in development, hopefully we'll get it done by the end of the year. Uh, same with the Helm chart, we're making really good progress on that as well. So uh, hopefully those will be done end of the year, early next year, uh, just to help support this. Uh, the next things that we're going to tackle are ClickHouse support officially. Uh, it's a popular backend right now. It's in our unofficial list of supported of backends. Uh, so we're going to make it official. Um, and then we want to do some other upgrades, both in the visualization, dependency views, and uh, eventually to make the UI more aligned with Otel uh, since Jaeger started with open tracing. And now, you know, that's changed. So, um, but we're always open to suggestions. So come by uh, our booth, we're there in the mornings, and, and make uh, any type of feature requests, suggestions. If you want to contribute, uh, that's always great. So we'll take a few questions, because we've got about five minutes. So feel free to go up to the mic or yell, and I'll repeat it. Uh, if you have any specific questions, happy to take them. Anyone? Got one. No problem. So the, the question was, how does Jaeger understand how to piece together all the different parts of the application? So the way that open telemetry works is that there's a unique ID for every trace, and the downstream uh, span tags back to the span before it. So it sort of creates a chain, and you can read those together. So it allows you to look at the, the ID of the trace and see all the subsequent spans off the trace. So. Yeah, there, there is a unique ID that is propagated throughout the request. And then Jaeger just correlates all the spans together by using that ID. Yeah. Yeah, the question is about the when the operator for V2 will be ready. I'm sorry? How, does, how do you install it? Without the operator, you have to do it yourself, create a deployment service. It's not difficult because it's a single deployment, so it's pretty easy to just create the raw Kubernetes objects and deploy it. Yeah. The, the support for operator will, will yeah, come soon. There is not much work left. I just wanted to answer the other question. In the UI, see that hex number that's right next to run test in the top left? That is actually the ID of this particular trace that we're looking at. So that's the unique identifier. Um, and then subsequently, there's unique identifiers for all the other pieces. Sorry to go back to the other question.
So the question is, where does that number come from? How does it get generated? So when you use open telemetry SDKs or auto instrumentation, which requires no code change, that number is automatically injected by the SDK or the agent into the trace. So it essentially modifies the request, puts that in, and then that's how everything gets chained together automatically for you. So by using the SDK, subsequent calls, you still need the SDK in all of the services or an agent. Otherwise, you'll have a broken trace where it may end and a new trace might start because it doesn't have that linkage. So by ensuring that you have instrumentation consistently, everything will flow together and you won't have broken traces. You'll see the end-to-end -end flow. So. Cool. Any other questions? Otherwise, uh, I did want to mention, oh, one more? OK. Uh, in our demos, we do manual instrumentation, I believe, right? Yeah. Not auto? Yeah, it's a manual instrumentation. And usually with the, with the databases, you don't instrument the database. You instrument the client that talks to database. Um, that's how it usually works. If you were to instrument the database, then you would probably get information how the database itself works, which is usually not important because you assume that it's implemented well and it's not going to be issues. Yeah, if you, if you instrument a database, which you can do, you'll end up with a bunch of weird internals that won't make any sense to you. So although you can do it if you're a serious database engineer, for the most part, uh, you instrument the client, that gives you all the SQL, the response time, everything else that you need here in the trace. So we got that question at the booth today, too, so it's a common one. Uh, any other questions? With that, I'm going to just leave the, you know, please review us uh, with the QR code. Uh, definitely join the Slack. We have a monthly call, uh, always open for discussions. And uh, we've got a blog and an X account and all of that stuff. So pop by the booth if you have any additional questions or want to see a deeper demo. And uh, thanks for attending. I hope you all have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>